Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with Longstreet Pediatrics. My name is Dr. Richard Shelton, and I'm a pediatrician here at the Longstreet Clinic in Buford. For those of you not familiar with Longstreet, we are a primary care and multi-specialty clinic with 10 locations located throughout North Georgia and more than 200 pr providers representing 18 medical specialties. Our pediatrics department sees patients at five different locations across North Georgia, including Gainesville, Oakwood, Buford, Baldwin, and Brazelton. Today joining me in our broadcast are a few of my fellow colleagues. We have Dr. Mitch Sheik from our Brazelton office, Dr. Rachel Crudgington and nurse practitioner Candy Evans from right here in Buford with me. So today we're gonna to talk about something that you may have heard a little bit about over the last few months um, called the coronavirus. You may or may not have not heard of that right now. Um, it's also known as COVID-19. And as for the young people out there, known as the Rona. So I know you probably are tired of hearing about it, reading about it, and living with it. But today we're going to take a little bit different approach. And we're going to talk about what it means for our children heading back to school this fall. Please be aware, though, this is a very fluid topic. And there are changes to plans every day, as we've seen even from this week alone. Each of the various school districts in our region have, have had plans and have changed plans. For instance, we've learned recently that Hall County Schools have pushed back the opening date of their school district. Gainesville City Schools are going to start online before heading back into the classroom. And several of our private schools are planning on a regular in-person uh, in start date um, right from the start. In fact, just this week, Gwinnett County has backtracked from their online only stance for the first semester to a graduated reintroduction into the classroom which is really too complicated for even me to, to go through right now. So I just suggest that you follow that online. As we've seen though, these plans are tentative and they are subject to change, but we will do our best to discuss going back to school in general and hopefully provide you with information to make, help you to make the best decision for your children. While none of us have a crystal ball to know what, when, what will happen in the future, we hope that by sharing some of our medical insights, we can have a helpful discussion to address some of these concerns and allay some of the fears and anxieties around COVID and also address both the psychological and mental health impacts that it's having on both parents and children alike as they return to the school setting. So without further ado, let's get started. First of all, Dr. Sheik, I wanna start with you. One of the major topics circling around our community is whether or not it is safe for our children to go back to the classroom. Many schools are offering both remote and in-person class options. What are some of the things that we that you might consider to help us make a decision on what is right for our children? So thanks for that question, Dr. Shelton. And you're right. Uh, there's a lot being said about return to school. Uh, the first thing is, is there's a lot of information out there. And we're hope, I'm hoping with us today, we can try to clarify that. And when I was looking online, there, the, there was not only information, but disinformation. So what I usually tell my patients is, what I like to use as guidelines, and that would be CDC, that would be AAP. Uh, and I, you know, I encourage them usually to look on those websites to see what we're gonna usually be doing, and that usually works. Now, going to the answer itself, usually what I try to tell people is there's no one answer. I don't try to tell you that there's just one thing that I'm gonna tell you to do, and that's what all you're gonna do. Usually, I go into your background. And usually it's two steps. First step is the child itself, your children, what's going on with your children, what kind of diagnosis, is there something chronic? And that's how I go it. And sometimes I even tell them it doesn't even have to be something medical where obviously we're always considering asthma as a chronic medical condition and letting them know that because it's asthma, you might have a higher risk, but you could even have someone I've come across with ADD and I usually tell them, I'm like, is, do you feel like your child will be able to do the three things, which is part of our risk mitigation, which is wearing the mask, cleaning their hands, and, and, and things like along those lines, and especially as a social distancing. If you think you're, you know, these are all there to, for me to help the parent make that decision. And usually that's what I try to tell them. So that's usually part of the first step. Now, usually by the time I get to this point, well, they start asking, well, you know, what are the, you know, what are the statistics? What does it look like out there? And I usually tell them, yes, you know, you're right. Um, if you're looking at your child, uh, the children are definitely, I mean, if you take everything as a total, the children are definitely less 
ill than their adult counterparts. And there's no doubt about that. If you just even look at the numbers, I mean, you put, if you have a hospitalized adult with the underlying condition, he has a 90% chance that they'll be in the hospital where with a child, it's only 50%. Then if you just look at the numbers in total, and this is directly, by the way, again, you go from the AAP uh, publish and they have these on there. As of July 14th, and I think at that point it was uh, something like 2.8 million uh, sick patients uh, nationwide, the total amount of pediatric patients that tested positive is anywhere between 6.1 and 7%. So we're looking at possibly just 200,000 of those. Now of that, 1% are hospitalized. And of the 1% hospitalized, we're talking about less than 0.3% death. So now I usually tell them all that to try to give them an idea of where we are, but I always tell them that does not mean your child will not get sick and will not have issues with this. So I always tell them always to take that into account. And then of course, uh, the second part is where the issues come in as far as transmission, because I've had a lot of people ask, and this is across the board. Well, if I send them into the school and then they come back in, what are my chances? What's going to happen with me? And this is how I try to stratify whether or not you should be one of the people uh, and, and to take into account whether or not they should go to school. Uh, just in the same as mine, we, when we had to make a decision, I have uh, my parents who are sick and they're having issues. So I had to make that decision based on what's going on with them as well. And they did say, you know, and I, I've had pa uh, parents tell me, yes, you know, my, sick, my child is sick and it might be difficult for that to happen. So I was like, yeah, and that's all the stuff you want to be thinking about. So the second part of that beyond just the parents, and I think we're going to be touching on this down the line, is mental health part of this. Um, you know, maybe it's hard. You have parents that are working. And I also have some statistics on that. Uh, for what parents have been dealing with. And again, these are uh, things that are, haven't been settled because there's information still coming in now, but they say one in four parents was having issues with mental health, whereas only one in seven children were having it. But as a combination, it was 10% overall. So that means 10% of the child population at home was having these problems. Um, and so these are all the things that I usually like to tell them. Now, sometimes what I try to say is, and, and, and you know, doing the research, you find that a kind of a way to try to separate out who's more at risk and less is even kind of using their age a little. Assuming you have no other risk, I usually try to go by below 10 or above 10, whereas they found that children under 10 years old are have less symptoms and have uh, uh, less of a chance of ending up in the hospital. So I usually try to use that. Okay. So let me ask you this, Mitch, uh, Dr. Sheik. Um, there are also questions being raised about younger children wearing masks in school. Um, do you think it's an effect? Do you think it's going to be more effective, or is it really going to be more of, of a distraction for the kids always adjusting the mask, playing with the mask, and those right. kind of things? Right. That is a great question. The idea there, and what I usually try to uh, uh, enforce with the parents is, don't wait for them to go to school and try to see if that works. Because most children, even like mine, they don't wear it at home and they have not had to go anywhere for a prolonged period of time where they have to keep these masks on. So what I tell them is do some days at home where you have them wear the mask and keep it on and see how they do with it and how they, how they adopt to having that mask on. Just like anybody else, and these are children, just trying to get them used to having the mask on before you send them to school will probably do them a world of good. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's talk to Dr. Crudgington real quick. Um, there's been some discussion uh, regarding wearing the masks outside and on playgrounds. You have two young girls at home. Um, what do you feel about that requirement? And do you think that it's uh, that the children are at risk for overheating or having difficulty breathing outside when they're playing in a relative heat of August as they head back to school? Thank you, Dr. Shelton. Yeah, um, and so like you mentioned, I have two daughters. I have a second grader and a sixth grader. Um, and so definitely with my second grader, she has her moments where she's just had enough of her mask and she needs a little break from it. Um, and we, if we're outside and she's not around anyone, I'll tell her she can go ahead and take her mask off. But the other thing that I always think about when they're playing together on playgrounds is if they are in close contact with each other, even if they're not directly um, in, in front of each other, if they're playing together and running around on playing on the same playground equipment, it may be helpful for them to still be wearing a mask, especially if they're a high risk child. 
Um, but I do think there's times naturally that they're able to take a break. And one of those times is definitely when they're outside and not around other people um, with that six foot um, social distancing. Thank you very much, great answer. Um, Candy, uh, many parents um, still have some anxiety about letting their kids go back to school again, even if they've made the decision to send them back to school. What's your advice to those parents? Keep it simple, be encouraging. Children will feed off the parents' um, anxiety or no anxiety. Keep it simple. Talk about the three things that we know are effective, and that is to wash our hands, wear a mask, and stay apart. You can talk about pretend you're in a bubble and you don't want anybody inside your bubble to pop that. Some of my patients, my, the moms have ordered the sports gaiters and put that up over their nose. That is much more comfortable and doesn't seem to fall down. And so I think that is a choice for children that might keep them from fidgeting and with the mask. That's actually a very, that's an excellent suggestion. And I hope that uh, parents do take that into account. Um, Dr. You can order them on Amazon. They'll come in three days. Great, <laughs> even a plug for Amazon. Um, <laughs> Dr. Sheep, one last question. Um, so if you have made the decision to send your kids back to school again, um, how should you restrict access to, let's say, grandparents or other at-risk individuals in their, uh, in their homes? So what I've been having those discussions at home because I try to, we're going to try to implement that uh, if the schools and we did make that decision to send them in and what I would tell other people is to create a routine when they come home. Basically, it's a routine where you would come through the door, you're going to take your clothes off, you would either take a shower, wash your hands, but just stick to that routine. And then therefore, you, there's less contamination. You're taking the shoes off at the front. You're going directly up. You're really not in contact with anything. You're basically washing up and therefore contamination is minimized. Great advice, great advice. Dr. Crudgington, back to you. You have children, as we, as we said before, you have two young girls that are in the Buford City Schools. Can you tell us a little bit about what they're doing as going back to school this fall, just as an example? Sure, so um, we actually are planning to start school next week um, on Wednesday, August the 12th. Um, we had to choose back in July, we chose if we were gonna do digital or if we we're gonna be in person. And about roughly 80% of the parents chose in person for their children um, within Buford City. Um, they do have an initiative at Buford that's called a one-to-one -one initiative where every child is given a Chromebook. So everybody has access and they have purchased a digital learning platform. So they're very well prepared for digital learning. But I think that a lot of parents felt like they were ready to get their kids back into the school system socially um, and felt like they were going to be safe. You know, we're, they're trying to distance. They're using um, this, the, the precautions that we talked about. They're encouraging masks, um, hand washing, social distancing wherever we can. Um, and so I, I feel um, like we are just making some progress. And we had our open house yesterday for my younger daughter and it was scheduled. It wasn't as busy as it has been in years past. And there were less parents there. Um, and you still had your time with the teacher and then moved on and the next group of parents came in. So I felt like if that's an indicator, um, I feel like they've put a lot of thought into it and have done a lot of planning. Um, of course, you can't plan for a pandemic, but um, they're, we're gonna see how it goes, so. Well, I think that's about, that's probably true with all the school districts right now. Um, I have two children, as, I have a 19-year-old who's in college in the Georgia State system, and I have a younger son who's starting high school in one of the private schools here. And they're a little bit different things. Uh, my younger son, uh, being at a small private school, they're going back face-to-face -face starting next week. Um, they're able to practice more social distancing just because of the smaller classrooms um, and also uh, they're already kind of spread out as it is. Um, as far as the colleges go, it's all over the place. I, there's everywhere from they don't know yet to hybrid systems to, I know we have a friend that goes to uh, Yale and uh, he'll be a sophomore this year. And he told me that the sophomore class is not allowed to come back. They'll be doing digital learning. Whereas the freshmen and juniors and seniors because of um, that is to, to uh, minimize the number of students in the dorms. 
whereas the freshmen and the sophomores are mostly in the dorms where juniors and seniors are mostly off campus. So they're trying, that's the way they're trying to do that. So there's a, so for colleges, that's kind of all over the board also. Uh, so we just have to all be uh, flexible at this time, I would say. Well, thank you all for that. Let's move on to another topic. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Miss Candy. Um, the pandemic has interrupted families' routines in several ways. Uh, but many parents have avoided well-child checks and also the uh, included vaccinations with those. Can you just speak a little bit about the importance of ensuring your child does get up to date on their vaccines and on their checkups? Yes, you know, um, well checkups are the foundation of pediatric health care. It's, it's a time where we monitor growth and development we make sure children are meeting their developmental milestones. If they're not, then interventions can be set up for that specific child. It also provides an opportunity for parents to discuss concerns regarding cognitive, uh, behavioral, nutrition. We screen for lead exposures and anemia at well child visits. We talk about safety from sleep position to car seats to boosters, bike helmets, lake safety with Lake Lanier being in our backyard. Um, vaccines are a time, at checkups, vaccines are the time we can get them up to date because we are worried that as children re-enter daycare and back to school, if their immunizations are not up to date, we are gonna see an uptick and some of the diseases that these uh, vaccines prevent. We know before COVID that we have a pertussis or whooping cough national outbreak continuously going on. And if we do not get that vaccination levels up, then we're, that's gonna only get worse. And then as we enter fall, we need so much. This winter is so different with flu vaccines. Um, we have, Influenza and COVID coming at the same time. They are both affect children with their respiratory system. That is just too much for children's lungs. And so the call us mid-September, we should know then when we're gonna start giving flu vaccines and can bring the children in to get this. It, flu vaccines are critical this year. Absolutely. and. You know, the one thing, you know, although a lot of things right now are, are very fluid and flexible with COVID, the one thing that is a constant is that we still need to do well child care and we still need to do all the things that you just explained so beautifully. Thank you very much for that. But let me ask you another question real quick, Ms. Candy. Uh, what is Longstreet Pediatrics in specifically doing to help ensure the safety of our patients and reduce the risk of exposure when they come into our offices? Yes, very good question. And a huge shout out to the pediatric leadership and the staff in our offices. The staff is working so hard to keep our offices clean. They are wiping down the entire exam room between every single patient. We have designated rooms in all of our offices for COVID patients with an air purifying system in those. We have plexiglass partitions in the front at the where check-in. Some of our families are choosing to check in on the phone from their car so they don't even have to come into the front. I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, rooms are out in the waiting room. We have social distancing seating set up. We are trying to bring our well in the morning and more sick in the afternoon. For select cases, we are continuing to do telehealth visits, and we are also offering some car exams that sometimes with weather permitting and the, the presenting complaint, that can be a very appropriate thing to do, whereas we will come out to the car and examine the child to limit the amount of exposures. And so I, I am just so proud of our staff and all that they are doing between every single patient. Thank you very much. And, and I want to reiterate that our, that our how, how much our staff is, is really working hard to reduce the exposures 
to our patients and to themselves also. Um, and that, like, I just want to reiterate that every time a patient leaves the room, the room is cleaned completely and wiped down completely before the next patient is allowed to come into the room. Also, you know, many of all of our ill patients are, are, come, are calling in uh, from the cars and they're checking in from the cars and being brought in from the, through the back door uh, to prevent any exposures to any of the well children coming in the front door. Uh, we also have separate places for them to sit even for the lab. So there are a lot of things that we are trying to do here at Long Street to prevent and to re reduce the risk of exposure. Um, speaking I, of exposure, yes. I forgot to add one other thing. Um, all, we, we are required to wear masks. The staff are required to wear masks. Our parents are required to wear masks. Ages two years and above, they are required to wear masks. And that is also one more layer of protection for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for, re for reminding me of that also. Thank you very much. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Um, speaking of, we talked about vaccines and the need for those. And we know that most of our vaccines are for our little ones. Um, so Dr. Crudgington, um, we know a lot of the pa parents around the community um, trying to struggle struggling with their own balance between you know their, their work and their and, and home and careers and transitioning and and we know the kids have been home and, and quarantined to some some extent for the last several months uh, we've had a lot of time that we've spent with um, kids being um, on more screen time than they normally would have um, why is it important to limit screen time and the technology in, in kids during this time um, and that's definitely something that um, that we um, hear daily at checkups because there's a lot more time on screens and parents will say, you know, in this time when we have digital learning, how much is too much time? Um, and ideally, we do try to limit more than two hours a day for our older kids, um, but it's very difficult to do at this time when they either don't have anything else to do or when they have to be online, you know, thinking about school coming up, digital learning and and things like that. So I think it's good just to try to take breaks. And um, I try to remind kids, if you've been online for you know a while, try to take a little break, do something different. Um, one of the things that um, that that we can encourage, and if, you know, if you've ever had a checkout with me, one of the things that I always encourage with kids is reading, taking time to read. And I think that's very important. Um, as you know, with the older kids, I always like to ask them, are you reading 20 to 30 minutes a day? Have you been spending a little bit of time reading alone? For the younger kids, this is something I wanted to focus on for just a few minutes. Um, just if they're being read aloud to at home, either by an adult or a caregiver in their home, um, by an older sibling. Um, and um, it's just a very important thing to spend time doing, reading aloud, is, is a very important thing for children to do. And um, we have a program through our office called Reach Out and Read. It's in the um, Hall County branches of our office. So in Gainesville, Oakwood and Brazelton. And we're very grateful with the generosity of the United Way of Hall County that's helped provide this program for our patients um, where babies are provided with a book as a newborn in the hospital. And then at their checkups between the ages of six months and five years, they're given a book and we talk about reading and they bring the book home with them. Um, and there are just so many benefits to reading with a younger child. So things like looking at their communication skills, it helps to develop those and prepare them for school as they get older. It helps to develop empathy and patience and work on their, lit their listening skills, um, prepares them to recognize letters and sounds and improves their memory. Um, and then just at a time when there's so much anxiety in the community and our kids are suffering with so much anxiety, just spending time reading with an adult or a trusted caregiver gives them the extra reassurance. It helps to give them a schedule at a time when they haven't had a schedule. Um, and so it's just something that I like to encourage. Um, like I said, it's something that we do with several of our offices. But even if you don't go to one of those offices, there's a website. It's reachoutandread.com. Dot org and they have ebooks they have books on coronavirus different things that you can look at to discuss um, current events with your child um, it's just a very helpful thing to have thank you very much and um, can you give that that website one more time for someone who may have not have caught it the first time sure it's reachoutandread.org thank you very much 
you know, with the uh, with the quarantine, we have had um, some issues of weight gain um, in our patients and some of our parents. Um, Dr. Sheik, um, can you please kind of discuss the importance of um, of exercise and, and healthy eating with regards to um, the weight gain that we've been seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that has been an issue. I discussed this with other providers. It seems like this is something that's going on at all our offices. So what I've been telling everybody is, you know, sometimes these, the children, and of course, sometimes, like you said, even the parents are eating out of boredom. And what we want to do is start creating, start creating a plan for uh, basically exercise where a lot of them are just playing video games for hours at a time. Now, I think once school gets on, some of that <laughs> might change, but they want to start creating a routine where it's five days a week. I, I usually say 45 minutes at a time of cardio uh, and start looking at their diet about what you can eliminate, the, sh the sugars and the juices, the high carbs, the cookies, uh, and, and start making a plan for that. And if I think if they start doing it on a regular, I even, I even tell I, what I tell my own kids, I'm like, you got to go play outside for one hour to be able to play your video games. And that usually really works because then they have to do it. They know it. Yeah, I'm not above bribing children to, uh, <laughs> to, to perform as you like them to, correct? That's right. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about exercise. And a lot, I know there's a lot of questions out there right now about children not only going back to school, but returning to their extracurricular activities, their sports, um, and things like that. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time answering a few questions that have come up um, that we've received prior to our, um, prior to our show today. Um, the first one is, do you, do you think schools should be limiting extracurricular activities and sports? Um, I, I really think that that is probably a good thing to do. I wouldn't be one that says they need to be eliminated totally, but I think, you know, it's really up to the Georgia High School Association in conjunction with their medical advisory board and the state health department um, to really have close um, follow-up with what's going on in the communities as far as our numbers and then make educated and, and logical decisions uh, regarding furthering those extracurricular activities. Some people have said, should all fall sports be canceled? Um, it's a very difficult decision. I will say this though, I'm not sure that youth sports and youth leagues um, should really be doing a lot of their normal activities this fall. Um, I understand some of the high school things and even colleges because of, you know, things that are involved with scholarships and, and all those kind of things that are, that are, that are involved there, but there, none of that is really going on for youth sports. Um, and to play in a high risk sport, which we will talk about in a minute, what some of those are um, in the younger age groups may or may not be the best decision. I know a lot of the metro area youth football leagues um, have pushed their, pushed, uh, their seasons into the spring. Um, and uh, that may be a very good decision. I know even colleges and even professional sports are even making decisions like that currently. Um, so I wouldn't say you have to just basically look at, do the risk clearly outweigh the benefits of your child playing that sport or that extracurricular activity? Um, so with that, you know, um, if they do decide to have fall sports, um, what precautions need to be taken? Well, like we've said before, um, there are the basic precautions, hand washing, social distancing, you know, wearing masks when, when, when appropriate. Uh, remember, according to the World Health Organization, the transmission of the virus can happen when your child is in direct contact with someone who is infected or when they is in contact with surfaces in the immediate area uh, or with objects that are used by the infected individual. So remember, this is a, um, a respiratory droplet um, virus. That's how it is transmitted. So those places where those um, situations cannot be controlled or at higher risk. What, what are some of those? Uh, let's look at what the, the Georgia High School, um, School uh, Association has said are the high risk, the moderate risk, and the low risk sports. High risk sports are considered those where there is close contact, close sustained contact, I should say, and a lack of significant protective barriers and a higher chance that respiratory droplets can be shared between the participants. 
What are some of those sports? Wrestling, football, boys lacrosse, competitive cheer, and dance. Now, I do have a little bit of, little bit of uh, personal feelings about basketball. My son plays basketball. I would consider that a high risk um, sport also. They put it into the moderate risk category. Not really sure how they do that or why, but I know there's a lot of phys close physical contact in basketball, a lot of respiratory droplets. And when they're sitting on the bench, I know there's not six feet of distance. So um, I wanna say, I would probably myself personally, I would put that into the high risk category also. But where are the moderate risks? Moderate risks are considered when there's close contact, but there is some kind of protection maybe involved and not as much sharing of one ball. Now, having said that, they put basketball, volleyball, baseball, and softball and soccer into that category. As far as I know, there's only one ball being shared between all those sports also. So I'm not really sure how that's in the moderate risk category either, but I guess smarter people than me have made that decision. Low risk category people, events would be individual running events, throwing events, individual swimming events, golf and weightlifting and cross country running if they are staggering the starts. If you've seen a cross country event, they normally start with a whole group of people right next to each other. I'm not sure that's really distancing, but if they're staggering the starts, that probably is okay. What are some of the um, advice we can give to parents regarding um, how can I make myself more comfortable with my child going back into sports? Well, it's as it is with school, we've said a lot of these things already. I'm not gonna go over all those again. Basically, don't share equipment with other kids. Bring your own water bottles. Make sure that they have, they're having some kind of social distancing and that they're doing good um, hand cleansing with hand sanitizer or whatever else they have there. Please talk to your coaches and talk to them and asking them about what they are doing um, to minimize risk and contact, um, especially no, you don't want them congregating after practice because I know that happens a lot. Guess what? That's, a, that's not going to be six foot of social distancing. So you want to make sure that they're not congregating before or after practices. And when they're sitting down in, in rest periods, do not have them sitting close to each other either. How can I protect my son at practice? Um, make sure you have, if you're in football, make sure you have an extra mouth guard because if yours falls out and you lose it, you don't want to be sharing one with somebody else. I'm not really sure you should be doing that anyway, but definitely not doing COVID. Um, make sure you have your know, own hand sanitizer and all those things, all the other practices that we've already discussed. There's really no magic here. There's no, there's no grand um, thing that we're gonna say about this, but just be smart about it just as you would at any other setting. Now, as far as you know, having other people come to games, because there will be games, whether or not they're going to allow spectators or not, that will depend upon the sport and, and the setting. But probably anyone um, who has any other ailments, as we as Dr. Sheik spoke about in the beginning, that would be adversely affected by becoming in contact with COVID, probably should not attend. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I do want to say one thing about school and about school. I know a lot of parents, not a lot, I know there's some that are out there that may, if their child feels ill in the morning, give them Tylenol and or ibuprofen, I mean, sorry, Tylenol, or, yeah, or, or Advil, and send them to school, hoping that they don't really show symptoms. Now is not the time to do that anymore. It is too dangerous for your child who is, even if they have not been proven to be COVID positive, but if they are sick at all, please keep them home. Please don't let them go to school, even if they're a little bit ill. It's just not worth the risk right now. So having said that, anybody, does anybody have any else, anything else they'd like to add? Any other words of wisdom for our families out there that they can shed on um, them before we, before we wrap up? Nothing? All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I know many of you have very busy schedules, so we appreciate you taking the time just to sit and, and watch us ramble on some time about COVID and about the Rona. Um, but we hope that, um, that you learned something today. We hope that what we said today will help you make some decisions about you and your children. Um, if you have any additional questions that we didn't address today, uh, please feel free to send us a message. You can do it through my chart 
or give us a call at 770-718-1122. If you found this information helpful, please feel free to comment and share this video with others. Hey, remember, we're all in this together. The health and safety of our children is of utmost importance. Please don't forget to wear your mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing, and encourage your children to do the same. Have a great day and stay safe. God bless. Oh, thank y'all all for helping me today.